Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session, Workforce of the Future. My name is Yesan Hawk. I'll be moderating the panel. Before I introduce the speaker, let me say a few things. <coughs> stage right. A few years ago, McKinsey, the company, did a study where they're able to identify the jobs that are going to be obsolete, as well as the other kind of jobs that's going to be high in demand. So it's clear that the jobs that require reputation, manual labor, will be gone. Any guess what the other kind of jobs are, which will be high in demand? What kind of jobs will be high in demand in the future? Caregiving. So, so say that again? Caregiving. Caregiving, OK. So um, Moshe is right. So it's more of you know, some of the human skills, so your ability to be able to be creative, get things done, focus, concentrate, work well in a group, build rapport, uh, tell a good story, be a good speaker. Uh, and the one of the questions that we'll try to answer through this panel is, is there a room for technology to help us build some of those human skills? I know it may sound counterintuitive. Hopefully, by the end of the panel, uh, this will be kind of clear. Something out here. So we have a very diverse panel today to talk about this topic. Uh, the first speaker will be Skip Rizzo who is a professor at the University of Southern California. Skip has done many years of research looking into AR, VR technology to help individuals with autism, PTSD, individuals with brain trauma, and he will tell us more about um, what's the latest in terms of technology, give us some demos and videos. Um, the second speaker will be Shamsi Iqbal, who from Microsoft Research, along with colleagues, they introduced the idea of microproductivity. In this age of inattention, where we're always distracted, yeah. is there a role for technology to kind of take a complex task and break into small pieces and finish them? So she will tell more about that. We're lucky to have Phil Pizzo, who runs the Stanford Careers, Distinguished Career Institute. Prior to that, he was the dean of Stanford School of Medicine for 12 years. So you'll look at the same problem from a different angle. Uh, I know that once I had a conversation with Phil, uh, he mentioned that a kid that's born today, there's a 60% chance he's gonna go live up to 100. So the notion that I'm gonna have education, then have a career and retire, it's no longer there. We may have multiple <coughs> careers, and how should you prepare for that kind of transition? And finally, we're gonna have John Kleinberg, who is a Tisch professor at Cornell University, and he will talk about, as we deploy many of this AI-driven technology, how do you ensure that the decisions that the systems make are fair and unbiased? So that's the agenda today. And the logistic is that every speaker will speak for 10 to 12 minutes. And hopefully, that will leave us 30 minutes of Q&A. I will also give a demo of a system that gives you feedback on your speaking skills. And during lunch, I was able to get Eric Horvitz uh, be a participant. So I have his data. So I'll show you how many times he said, um, mm. Um, how, the characteristics of his smile. So I'll give that demo as well. So on that note, uh, let's welcome our first speaker, Skip Rizzo. Thank you. Okay. I think, um, oh, there we go. All righty. Well, I'm going to make the case that the field of mental health treatment and rehabilitation is going to be fundamentally changed by the introduction of technologies in ways that people haven't anticipated, and the skill sets of the people that are going to graduate school now um, will start to change. And I hope I be, I'm going to be able to make the case here. I'm going to start off uh, very simply by um, presenting a couple of use cases in the areas that we work in. Uh, to kind of give you an idea of the mental health and rehab space uh, that we've addressed, and then present some use cases showing how it's been done previously and how we're going to be doing it now and in the future, um, and also the impact that it has on our patients. Um, a lot of the work I'll be presenting is from our research institute, the Institute for Creative Technologies at the University of Southern California. Um, our lab is the MedVR lab. We've been around for a while. Over the years, we've um, addressed psychological issues, cognitive assessment and rehabilitation, 
physical therapy, occupational therapy, and use of virtual humans. And just a quick run through. That's a simulation of Iraq or Afghanistan that we use to deliver exposure therapy to treat PTSD in service members coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. That's what it looked like 10 years ago. You can see the improvements in the graphics, but in this case, we took a treatment system and translated it into a cognitive assessment system. So within that environment, military relevant environment, we assess attention, memory, executive function, things like that. Uh, we don't just do military stuff. This is from way back, 1997, I believe. It doesn't always have to be immersive VR. You can interact with stuff. In this case, a mental rotation training system. Um, another application for children. This is what a child sees in a headset. This is from 2003, I believe. Um, a test of attention processes. So child has to pay attention stimuli on the blackboard. But meanwhile, there's distractions in the classroom. Teacher answers the door. Kid in the back just threw a paper airplane. Uh, school bus can go by the window and so forth. Um, in physical therapy, this is something we use Microsoft Connect and various other sensors to track user movement, embed it within a game-based environment to try to make the very boring, repetitive, and often frustrating work of physical therapy after a stroke or a brain injury, spinal cord injury, um, a little bit more fun and engaging so that people do more of it. Um, and then our virtual human work in these areas, um, this is an app from 2012, I believe, a virtual patient that we developed for the USC School of Social Work as a training tool, and I'll let a little bit of this play out. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So I like to say that um, this gives novice clinicians in training a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. And if, uh, you know, when I went to grad school as a clinical psychologist, my first year, I read a couple books on therapy, took a couple classes, uh, maybe role played a little bit with a fellow grad student, and then I'm seeing patients. So I think we can up the game in clinical uh, training uh, by the use of this kind of technology. Finally, this, um, this character was a guy we put online uh, starting around 2011, and it was for um, military service members and veterans coming back from the war that didn't want to go see a shrink, didn't know if they had a problem, um, but they could go online and talk about PTSD, get asked questions. Character would do some screening questions back. At some point, he may say, hey, it looks like you're going through some, some hard times. If you punch in your zip code on the right, I'll pop up a list of providers in your area, and I can talk to you a little bit about treatment. So not a replacement for clinical care, but a toe in the water. I'll just let him introduce himself real well, quick. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Okay, so with that, if we look back in history, um, clinical VR really got its traction back in the early to mid-90s, mainly focused on exposure therapy for people with phobias, fear of heights, flying, public speaking. Since that time, the last 25 years, as the technologies advanced, we've seen really uh, uh, an evolution of the scientific literature documenting where VR makes a difference. And these are clinical conditions where either as an assessment tool, treatment tool, or a tool for scientific research, VR is, is pretty, pretty well documented to be of value in these areas. Um, the best metaphor for why we apply this clinically is aviation simulation. So just as an aircraft simulator would test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, teach, and treat a wide range of human activities all using simulation technology and AR. When I talk about this, I'm you know, talking generally mixed reality, um, and it's the ultimate Skinner box, particularly with VR. Um, so the use cases, you've seen the beginnings of some of these and uh, some of the work that I outlined. 
But just real quick, if you look at traditional methods for cognitive assessment, you have a child, your, your kid, you're not sure if he has uh, ADD or uh, perhaps autism or whatever, you bring him to a neuropsychologist and you give him a battery of paper and pencil tests. Well, that, those are all skills that will probably be maintained, but in the future, clinicians, and currently clinicians are using this, are going to be using things like the virtual classroom I showed from 2003. This is an updated version uh, that we developed and tested um, with a Taiwan population, in, in a group in Taiwan, in Taipei. But basically, a controlled stimulus environment for assessing attention under realistic conditions where we can introduce distracting stimuli similar to the test environment, the criterion environment. Here's um, another feature to this. Uh, this is a parent talking about the very first version we did uh, from 99, 2000. It does offer one clear benefit to parents of children with ADHD, empathy. Whoa. It just punctuated to me how utterly distractible the minds, their minds are. Just to see the process helps me understand them even more and maybe to be even more patient with them. If anything, I could feel what it was like to be in their shoes. I want. So, um, another project job interview training with high functioning folks on the autism spectrum. Uh, built a variety of characters that could serve the role as a job interviewer for training. Um, we could make, we could put them in different backdrops, make them cranky or make them, you know, positive or neutral. Here's this character uh, in a more positive state. I'm glad you're here. In a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? Now, we can make her cranky or we could pick another character and do that. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. That said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? It's a good program, and it teaches you how to do an interview, and it teaches you how to be in an interview situation with another, with another person. And did you see your performance improve? Did it, you get better? I get, I, get, I get better. Every single time I do it, I get better. So um, that's some data from uh, previous work, and now it's been expanded to use by veterans and incarcerated juvenile delinquents about to be released. So generally, um, it's going to change the way the vocational counselors work with folks. So um, a little bit different. There's a little bit of therapy in here, a little anxiety reduction, but it's a skill training tool. Um, physical therapy, this is an easy one. You can see traditional methods for physical therapy. Now physical therapists, in addition to doing this, I'm not saying we're going to throw everything out, but are going to have to know how to work with software and how to set things up in a way where people can do things like this. You know, upper extremity reaching with a leap motion attached to the front of a headset so you can see your hands in real time, um, but interact with 3D graphics. And Here's a little more, and I'm just going to pop up this person here real quick. I feel like um, I'm uh, in on the cutting edge, <laughs> and that is very exciting. So we're not just changing uh, practice. We're changing how our patients might interact with practice and maybe engage them in ways that, um, you know, be difficult with traditional methods. Um, standardized patients, getting actors to you know, be part of the training, as you saw with the, um, the social work application. Well, we've gone from that to a system where it's a configurable system uh, where you just like the job interview, you can pop the character into different backdrops and you can author natural language dialogue management. You can select from a library of 40 different characters. You can inflate each character to three different weight classes. Um, and generally, you can go from the old way of, you know, see one, do one, teach one in medicine to, you know, continually practicing with various virtual patients until your scores reach a certain criterion. Finally, uh, therapy, traditional therapy. Well, um, you know, talk therapy, we all know what that is, um, and that will always be a part of therapy. But we can now start to do things where we can put people in simulations that are relevant to amplify the traditional treatments that already we know 
pretty, work pretty well, but we can do it a little better. We can create emotionally evocative environments, for example, to help patients with PTSD confront and process difficult emotional memories in a safe place. Um, and this is the core of prolonged exposure and evidence-based approach. And the clinician now has to learn how to operate a control panel to create the world in real time around the user's experience to customize it. Um, here's what that looks like. Huh? Everything in this world is controlled in real time by the clinician. The time of day, the sound effects, explosions, uh, number of people in the environment. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left, but I think that's pretty good after seeing him do the things that he's done. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Atlanta. So, last piece, how far are we going to go with this? Um, well, what about AI-driven therapists? Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? And this definitely will be probably the, the most contentious issue in clinical psychology moving forward. As AI gets better, where can we fill in gaps and where do we start replacing real people? Uh, you know, we can't tend to think factory workers, long-distance truck drivers, okay, automation, what, not therapists. Um, well, who knows where that's going to go. I think we have to tread very carefully. And I'm going to stop there. Just a few hot topics that I'll just uh, list off here, but uh, thank you for your time. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shamsi Iqbal. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research. I usually spend unexplainable amounts of time trying to come up with a title for my presentations. And this time, it was no different. And I was stuck with this idea of a rooftop as a counter to a desktop. And the reason behind this is that from where I come from, the rooftop is thought as a place where you hang out, you move away from your regular environment, you go there to relax, to talk to other people, maybe have a cup of tea. And um, well, this is an aerial view of Dhaka, which is the city that I hail from. It also connects me to Esan, who is also from there. So I thought that this would be a nice kind of metaphor to use. But what I wanted to point to it as part of my talk is that we are no longer constrained to being in one place to get our things done. And that also means that our workers are also not constrained to one place or one uh, notion in terms of getting their, uh, achieving what they want to do. So I use this graphic in terms of thinking about the workforce of the future. On the horizontal axis, we have on one end the human who brings their individual skills and expertise to get things done. On the other end, we have AI or automation that at this point can help people do some of those routine tasks so that people are freed up to do the things that they're good at and they have unique skills and expertise. On the vertical axis, we have the range of people who are doing the task. On the top, we have the human, again, individuals who can do smaller scale tasks, ranging to groups of people who come together to get done something that is big and substantial. So in this sense, the workforce of the future is also about the workplace of the future. Where are these type of things getting done? And again, I would like to make that point is that doing work is no longer constrained to being at a desktop or being at a desk inside an office. And if you want proof of that, 
Think about the amount of work that you can get done on a laptop when you're away from your office, away from your natural environment. I mean, even further proof, open up your smartphone and see how many emails you have checked or triaged and how many conversations you have had that are maybe related to work. Part of the reason why we think this way and why this fits into the workplace of the future is that the device ecosystem that we have is becoming increasingly mobile. And this fits nicely into kind of the fragmented attention concern that we have, is people have limited attention because they are trying to do multiple things at the same time. If you uh, go back to this morning's keynotes, and uh, Gloria Mark brought that up in, in many ways, is that we are having difficulties in having focused attention. So when we are on a mobile device and we are going across from, we're always on the go, getting things done in a focused manner becomes much more difficult. And so those are some of the challenges that we are trying to address, is that we have this mobile workforce who are getting things done when they're on the desktop, but they also have this opportunity to get things done when they're mobile. So this is where the concept of microproductivity is super relevant because that exactly allows us to do those kinds of things. So if you had missed this morning's session on microproductivity, it's about getting things done in short bursts of time, which are contributing towards a larger goal. The reason why microproductivity is relevant for this conversation is because our attention is fragmented. Our mobile devices actually can do much more than it was able to do before. So we are able to not only do communication, but we are actually able to carry out real tasks. There are also many micro moments throughout the day. As the presentation started, maybe there was a gap between the change of speakers. Maybe some of you quickly checked your email to see if there is something that you needed your attention. When you are transitioning from one place to another, you check your email, you maybe cross off a couple of things from your to-do list. So we have these micro moments where we can actually fit in a lot of things. There's also evidence that micro tasks are more resilient to interruptions because there are these small things that you can actually finish before you have to respond to an external interruption. So we are already doing a lot of tasks that kind of are micro tasks, and these are mostly communication kind of tasks. These are email, these are uh, instant messaging, to-dos, maybe some kind of web, web browsers. What we typically don't think of is doing complex tasks in terms of micro tasks. And there, I mean, who wants to do coding or writing a document on their phone or when they're on the go? And part of the reason is because complex tasks are not only suited for micro moments, they're also not necessarily suited for mobile devices. I mean, think about trying to read a document on your mobile phone or trying to do bug triage on your phone. It's not really easy. So that's where we, are, we have been trying to go with uh, in our research over the past few years. And I'm going to quickly go over a few projects that show how we have started to think about adapting the productivity tasks that we have into these like smaller micro tasks that can fit into these micro moments with the goal of leveraging the mobile, uh, the, the time that we have scattered throughout the day and getting sub something substantial done out of it. So I'm going to start off with editing on the go. So we typically don't think of writing as something that we do in small chunks of time, though there are parts of writing that we could actually fit into these smaller micro moments. So we developed this tool called Playwright, which essentially is part of a framework that extracts micro tasks out of your Word document. As an initial implementation, so we went with some simple tasks like correcting spelling, correcting grammar, uh, shortening text, and we wanted to see that how people interacted with these tasks when they were on the go. The way that the tasks were designed is that they're context-free, so you didn't need a ton of surrounding text to be able to do the tasks on the go. And so this is kind of like how it works. You work in a Word document. It the, the framework uh, or the Word plugin extracts the tasks and loads it up to a server. Your mobile app pulls those tasks down. You do the tasks and the outputs are then fed back to the server and then later integrated into the document. So again, these are, it looks like a very game-like interface and that was one of the motivations is that we wanted this to feel not super engaging, but something that you can quickly go through, get things done, move forward without feeling that you're really eating into your mobile time or your free time. 
so the, once we did writing, and it's by no means finished, we are still thinking about how, uh, how we can move forward with this research. We started to think about, okay, so let's look at even more uh, complex tasks. What about programming? Because no one wants to do programming on their phone. And uh, last year, as a part of a summer intern project, we talked to a bunch of developers and we did a survey and we asked them is that, what do you use your mobile phone for in tasks uh, related to programming? So it turns out that people are mostly using their mobile phone when they're away from their programming task for resource gathering. Things that they wanted to do is they wanted to do some kind of bug triage, something that's more related to programming. And part of the reason is not because they want to keep on working all day, but it's actually, it's almost the contrast. So they felt that they were tethered to their desktop and they were not able to leave because they couldn't carry on their tasks in an opportunistic fashion when they were away from the desktop or away from their office. So that was kind of the motivation to see that, okay, so what kind of tasks can we offer on the mobile device that are reasonably context-free, that people can do in short bursts, and then the, uh, the results, can, they can use them back later when they come back to their uh, programming environment. The other goal that we had for this work was trying to see that whether or not this helped people keep the context alive. So if you're interacting with a mobile, uh, interacting with a microtask on a mobile device, even though if it's a few seconds of interaction, it might help you quickly resume your task when you get back to your uh, real programming environment. Uh, this one was a bit more pushing the boundary of what, what are the things that we can do. And this was partly motivated by the fact that when we are commuting, we have this free time, essentially, where we are driving, we have lots of thoughts, and there's really no good way of collecting these thoughts. So we wanted to see that, okay, so there is some free time, if I might say so, and there are, so our part, past research has shown that there are, there are moments during driving where you have some cognitive resources available to be able to do other stuff. Now, we are already doing stuff in the car. We are interacting with in-vehicle in systems. We are talking to people in the car, but we are doing it in a fashion that typically does not inter, interfere with your driving. I mean, at least for the more, uh, I would say, safer drivers. So we wanted to see, and this was a study in a driving simulator, what happens if we take a productivity-related task, such as editing a document or creating a PowerPoint slide, and try to produce something via speech. So the idea was that there is an intelligent assistant in the car that will converse with the driver, taking into account the road conditions, taking into account the driver's mental state, and ask these questions to the driver, which would have very short answers. And in the process, these answers would be collected and then compiled as a document later that the driver can access. So it turns out that the design of these questions is super important. Uh, our system had two goals. One is that it asked certain very specific questions about, okay, this is a PowerPoint deck, what is the title? What, is it going to have any images? Are there going to be bullet points? So it's almost like yes or no questions. And if people don't create slides that way, it can be incredibly disturbing. So the other option that we had tested is that we had this assistant just lead people through with, okay, what next? So uh, again, this suggests that if we want to develop interfaces for the car, and we had done this research with an with a eye towards the future uh, of self-driving cars, is that what kind of things can we do in the car, which is still a limited attention environment? And so, so there are definitely some things that we need to think about. So uh, yeah, the second last one is that the other, other thing is that when you, how do you disengage and re-engage with work? So when you leave work at the end of the day, people typically carry work with them at home in their heads, thinking about work. And so we wanted to see that, can we use the time when they're moving out of their office, can we use that time for people to actually start re de disengaging from work and help them re-engage when they come back later the next day? And so this was done via two simple questions at the end of the day. We asked them about to reflect on what they had done during the day and what they wanted to accomplish the next day. And the next day when they would come back, we would reflect back that information that people would, that would help people actually save time that they would otherwise have used to, uh, to catch up on information or catch up on the tasks they wanted to do for that day. Uh, 
it turned out to be surprisingly success successful. Uh, people tended to be more productive in the first hour when they came out, and they felt also less stressful when they had, uh, had done that disengagement exercise at the end of the day. The last topic is about, OK, so you have all these complex tasks. How do you create these workflows or these micro tasks out of it? We wanted to just look at writing as our starting example. And so we did some research looking at the <laughs> comments that people leave in documents, which are typically pretty abstract, pretty, pretty uh, uh, high level, and we wanted to see if we could break down them in a manner that we could identify micro tasks that the user themselves could do or other people could do or things that could be automated that eventually would help save effort and help the user focus on things that were super, that were, uh, that they had the unique uh, capability to address. So this is kind of like our first step towards creating these mobile workflows, and so we hope that we could start using these kinds of vocabularies to help people, at least as a beginning, to start thinking about how we can help people create microtasks on the go. And some open questions that I had, and so I'm sure that these will come back during the panel discussion, is that how can we easily identify what parts of a task uh, can be done when we are away from a desktop? So there are certain things that we do need to have focus time for, and we are, we are not suggesting that everything needs to be done in micro moments. What is the quality of work? I think that's, that's a fair question to ask, is that if I'm doing things on a mobile device, is how good is it? And I mean, the question that is probably I mean, on everyone's mind, how can we protect our time away from work? And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Phil Pizzo. I'm a little different than many of you. I'm a physician scientist by background and training. And I want to talk with you about a different aspect of the workforce than we've talked about today. And that is the dramatic changes that are taking place as a consequence of lifespan and longevity. You may not recognize this, but in a century, we've gained more than 30 years of life expectancy. In fact, today, and every day until 2030, 10,000 people are going to cross the age of 65. That's going to mean that we'll have 20% of the population in the US who will be older than 65 by that time. But in fact, in Japan, it's already 26% today. And in many parts of Western Europe and Asia, it's going to approximate 40%. So this is a significant shift in terms of how we think about the social narrative that begins with education, work, and retirement, and how we think societally about how the impact of an aging population is going to be on all of the events that take place during the life journey. So when you think about this on an individual level, I think most of us, as we think about our lives, would like to have ourselves functioning fully until the day we're biologically not able to do so and then fall off the curve. And while there are some, particularly in Silicon Valley, who have the illusion that they'd like to, like to live forever, my view is that we ought to be looking at ways of aligning our lifespan and our health span so they're mostly concordant with each other. But that's not what many people get. What most people wind up having is a gradual decline loss of function, which by the way begins when we cross the age of 30, but it accelerates over time. And I think the question is, can we do something to attenuate that? When we look at this from a societal perspective, the Hartford Foundation has actually looked at how they might grade nations in terms of aging societies. And they've looked at a number of factors that are important. One of them is well-being. What's the degree of disability? The second is, what's the degree of equity? How much disparity is there in socioeconomic status? The third is cohesiveness. What's the degree of intergenerational interaction that's taking place? The fourth is productivity. Are people continuing to be productive? And the fifth is security. How safe an environment is a country um, bringing forward? The US actually does pretty well on this scale, largely because of productivity which is different from other parts of the world, where mandatory retirement still follows the benchmark that was first guided by Bismarck 
in the 1880s when 65 was put forward as the age of retirement. And of course, that was codified in this country when Social Security came about in 1935. But when you think about it, if you're in your 50s or 60s and you have 20 to 30 years ahead of you, is it really sensible to think about retiring when there may be important ways of being productive you know, going forward? So this is, I think, a very important issue for all of us. And when you look at what people are choosing to do now, nearly 40% of individuals who've crossed the age of 65 are seeking to continue to work. And the Transamerica study that was done last year demonstrated that over 80% of employers recognize that their workforce might, in fact, like to continue in some capacity going forward. If you look at people who have started new business, who have an entrepreneurial activity outside of tech, the average age is about 47. And when you look at the impact of an aging workforce on some companies, such as BMW, they've actually demonstrated that you can increase productivity and reduce um, loss of personnel. So it's important for us to kind of think about what this means as we go forward. And with that context, I began wondering about what's the role of higher education in helping people make this kind of a transition. Here too, there's an old narrative. Um, higher education has been doing the same thing for a millennia, which is important and it's impacted all of us. It's about educating young people. But as we think about our transitions, is there an opportunity to think further about that going forward? We know from a lot of epidemiological data studies done by Raj Chetty in the last couple of years and Angus Deaton at Princeton um, that education, high school education and above, is one of the single most important factors that contribute to positive longevity. But there are at least three other factors that make a major difference that we can do something about. And none of them will surprise you, but when you put them together, they might make a difference. One of them is the importance of having a sense of purpose. When you wake up every day, you think about what you're gonna do, and if it's meaningful to you, that's a really important thing. We know from a study that was just reported a month ago from the University of Michigan, based on the retirement survey, that in people over 50 who've lost a sense of purpose, there's a highly significant difference in all-cause morbidity and mortality. And purpose here, particularly for people in midlife, often has a more altruistic generative component about people who want to do something that's good, not necessarily in the same tradition um, that they might have uh, in the past. The second factor is connectedness or social engagement. It's interesting that two studies were just published in the last several months that demonstrate that in the US and in fact in the UK and other countries, there is a prevalence of loneliness of anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30 percent. This is becoming a social phenomenon um, that is really important. And we know that when people leave their workforce, that they often lose um, their kind of their connectedness that is really important to them. And from studies that were done at the University of Utah, we know once again from a large meta-analysis that when people lose social connectedness, there is a significant increase in all-cause morbidity and mortality. And not surprisingly, on the wellness side, looking at it from a physical, emotional, and spiritual perspective, when one maintains a sense of wellness, it has a huge impact on how well people do versus not. So with those in mind, those three variables that are interactive with each other, we started a program at Stanford which we're using as a starting point and exemplar, which we think will have relevance to other higher education programs nationally and globally going forward. This is called the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. It's built on these three intersecting variables of renewing purpose, building community, and recalibrating wellness. The program takes people who are in midlife. In our case, it's anywhere from 40s to 70s. We take a limited number of individuals because we're interested in sustaining community. So we're admitting 30 people a year. They can bring with them or nominate a life partner or spouse. And they spend a year at Stanford as a non-matriculated graduate student. Now we're interested in those individuals as part of a longitudinal study, whether we can compress their morbidity. That is, shift to the right the onset of chronic declines and make the duration shorter. But we're also interested in whether we can change institutions as well. 
So our fellows, when they come to Stanford, come with a prior background. They've had very distinguished careers, but they're interested in shifting to something else. They just don't know how to get there. And so we ask them to choose a new purpose pathway. We align them with a faculty advisor. And then importantly, they cl take classes side by side with undergraduate and graduate students. Same classes, they do the work, um, and it creates an incredible interactive environment. What we've seen in the last several years since this program has been alive is that it's literally changing the way our students are looking at aging as well. They want to be partnered um, with these individuals in midlife, not just because they want to talk about courses, but because they want to talk about life. And faculty love having them in the class because they actually do the work um, and pay attention during the class as well. We work with our fellows to help concretize their way of thinking about purpose by having um, collaborated with our design school and developed a course called Designing Your Life, um, which is a year-long course um, that allows people to work individually and in small groups. And then we complement that um, with memoir writing and guided autobiography so that as fellows go through the program, they're really thinking about what they're going to be doing in the future. We build community by bringing people together, which is one of the most powerful things that we have observed. People who have not met each other are literally becoming new and indeed lifelong friends. And then we work with a wellness group on recalibrating wellness. From our perspective, what we're seeking to do with this is to determine again whether individually and collectively we can compress morbid morbidity and improve the quality of life. We're not so much interested in exactly what the person does, except we know that many of them are seeking to go back to the workplace in different ways, as mentors, as teachers, as advisors, or for those who are younger, um, to start whole new jobs and careers again. Now, we're taking this one step further because we're seeking to collaborate or set up a collaborative with other colleges and universities around the country. In fact, there have been a number that have already started programs. We're not franchising this model, um, but Notre Dame, University of Texas at Austin, University of Michigan have already started um, programs. There will be one at Oxford um, next year, and there are many other large and small colleges and universities that are interested in the idea. And what we're interested in is ultimately developing a large population science collaborative so that we can test not only impact on individuals, but also societally. If one thinks about it, given this big shift in the demography that I've already addressed with you, and the um, unfortunate potential that unless people are doing better, they may consume more resources, a really important question is, can we reduce the need for medical and social services if not only individuals, but communities are doing better? So what I'm describing to you today um, is a um, feature that we haven't yet spoken about, I don't think, very much during this conference, and that is that we're in the midst of this huge demographic shift. It's going to alter the way we think about work and workforce. It will shape the way we think about retirement um, and productivity um, in the future. And we believe that higher education serves as an important bridge from transition from one career to a new one um, for the future. So thank you very much for listening. How many of you are scared of public speaking? Raise your hand. We have a brave audience here. Nobody's scared. Well, there's one in the audience in the stage. Um, so I'm going to demo a tool that can give you feedback on your public speaking skills. Um, I'm not going to be able to bring one of you in and give a live demo, but I was able to get Eric Horvitz during lunch to try this out. It was unscripted, so I just he was nice enough to try this uh, in a second notice. So let's see what kind of feedback he has received. So that's the interface. I can, you know, immediately you can tell the purple line correspond to smile, so he did not smile much. The yellow line correspond to body language, so it's clearly something happened here. We can watch the video. I'm just amazed how little progress we've made on what I I'm not going to play the entire video, but you know, something happened interesting here. So let's see and see what, why did that go up. So we can go there and take a look. So what did you do And there? manipulate it with ease in context. And finally, how do we learn from 
one task or problem to solve some. So you use gestures in a meaningful way, which is great. So you can also take a look at his volume modulation, and he did a great job modulating his volume. Uh, we can also take a look at what he said. So it looks like he said the filler word so multiple times. This is a word cloud of some of the things he said. And this is like an automatically generated feedback. And if Eric is comfortable, he can click on this. And that creates a private link that you can share with people in your social network or by email to people that you trust. And people can give him feedback. So let's take a look. Um, so let's say, uh, why not smile a bit? Oh, let me post it here. I'm just amazed how little progress and knowledge and then manipulate it with ease in context. And finally, how do we learn? So let me give a feedback on movement. Nice job on hand gestures. And then I can post it. Um, I can also comment, let's give him all maximum for participating. From one task or problem. And I can click here, submit, and this is going to appear uh, in, his, uh, in his video here very shortly. Um, so this is a recorded one. This is what it looks like when you get a bunch of videos from people that you trust. Here, this is where the comments appeared. Uh, the red correspond to a constructive or positive comment. This is more of like a, something to work on. So immediately, this is a symbiosis of human feedback combined with AI-driven feedback. So we can go back and, you know, some of that appear already. Why not smile a bit more and all that. So, all right, so this is a tool that we built now. Um, and if you want to mess with it, you can go to rockspeak.com and do this on your own. But interestingly, you can say this tool is cute, but does it really help improve soft skills? And if it does, how does it help? So with my time today, I will try to answer these two questions. So to study this, we ran an experiment where we hired 30 online workers, uh, mechanical turkers, and we gave them a task where they would upload videos of different job-related prompts every other day using the RockSpeak platform. And as you can tell, the first prompt and the last one are the same, so we can measure how well they changed in the 10-day period. And also, we can look at, take a look at the trajectory of how they are improving. So in addition to getting AI-driven feedback, we built an EY where they can go in. And it's like a Facebook feed where they can select up to three people. They can give feedback to more people as well and give them written feedback. And we combine them together. And then we took the video and showed it to experts from Toastmasters in a random order to get the performance. And the control condition here was uh, individuals are writing comments to each other. There was no AI involved. And the treatment was AI human symbiosis. So given the five prompt, the five videos, you can tell in the beginning, treatment is doing slightly better. Prompt three, they catch up. Prompt four, they both go down, but treatment is doing better. And in prompt five, treatment does significantly better than control. And we ran six independent instances of the same experiment and were able to replicate the results. So going back to the first slide, yes, it does help if you use a metric called performance uh, that's standardized, repeatable. With that metric, we can tell something is changing, they're improving. Now the second question, which is a bit more difficult to answer, like why does it help, right? Uh, that's when we made an observation that imagine each person being a node and the fact that they're writing feedback to each other becomes an edge. Then the entire interaction becomes a dynamic network. And when we frame it that way, we can use existing algorithm from graph signal processing or network science to be able to model that interaction. Uh, so here you can tell that given that each prompt, the connections are changing. Um, so how do I study this? How do I know that, you know, that human element is doing something, because that's the hunch. We don't think the AI itself is doing something. The fact that people are interacting with each other, they are showing empathy towards each other, it's something doing something. So to study that, we set up a hypothesis where, in a one condition, we're going to predict their final performance, which is the final performance by looking at the past history. Right? It's just a linear regressor. In the other condition, we're going to look at the past performance as well as 
who they interact with, and their performance as well. If the peer performance is doing something, hopefully in the second condition, we're going to do a better job in predicting the final performance. So what do we find? Here we have this two condition. In one condition, we have the network. In another condition, is network agnostic. And this is the error. So lower the number, the better. So in group one, the 30 online workers, we can do a better job predicting the final performance when you take the network into the consideration. We repeated the experiment again with six, uh, 30 more people. Um, and then we were able to replicate this. And we did this four other times. And we were able to replicate the results. Now, one problem with a dynamic network is for a given prompt, I can have three people give me feedback. But for the second prompt, that can change. New people can give me feedback. So it's really easy, difficult to study how the peer interaction is evolving through time because there's a lot of noise. So how do you fix this? So we ran the same experiment again, but this time with a static network. So imagine I'm the middle person. I have three fixed peers or friend. And we're going to give feedback to each other. And that's going to stay constant throughout the entire experiment. So when you instantiate that, this is what the network looks like. Um, and then, of course, the condition remained the same. Three fixed pair for everyone, five prompts in 10 days. And it allows us to be able to track how the skills are propagating across the network. So what do we find? So we find that in both static and dynamic network, people do improve their speaking skills in both condition, which is good. Um, one other question is, what attributes the performance improvement? And that's the, probably the most uh, important information I can give you today, which is about the quality of the peers. So given the network, if the peer that I interact with, if they're better than me, my performance in that prompt will be better. Versus if I'm stuck with people who are worse than me, my performance goes down. So that's a robust effect we're able to see. Also, in terms of feedback, if the feedback contains words like excellent, way to go, great job, not very helpful. When it's constructive, like this is why I give you a lower rating, uh, this is how you can fix it. So that kind of feedback was very indicative um, on improvement. So that was the qualitative metric. We also had people fill out a survey, so we can run a qualitative analysis as well. So what we found is people like the fact that as I'm giving you feedback, they can come back and take a look at my video to see how I've done it. So that kind of connection was very helpful. Uh, empathy was a big part. Uh, be able to show, you know, I understand you're going through a tough time. Um, I understand. So those kind of sentences, those kind of support were very valuable. Uh, some people make slow progress, but it's important that that's being acknowledged. So that was a very important aspect of the improvement. So if I give you a performance, like a speaking performance, and if there are three judges, it's very likely they're going to have disagreement with each other because that's what soft skills are for. It's very diverse. And that's why it's very difficult for AI to be able to provide a metric. Uh, but that's exactly what the participants liked about it because there's a huge diversity in the type of feedback they're receiving. And they're able to take a look and make a decision for themselves. And of course, a sense of community safety uh, is always enjoyable. So within the two minutes that I've left, I'm going to show you two examples of zoom into a network and give you an example of how people are interacting and exchanging ideas. Um, here, there are two individuals, ID 18 and ID 9. They both are online workers. The prompt was, tell me about yourself. You can tell this person. Hi, I'm Julius. And I'm a former tech recruiter that's making the transition into web development. Here's a few highlights. of. So that was the video. And then this peer. I uh, wrote a comment like this. It's a bit unusual to stand in front of your computer, but if you can find a way to do so comfortably, I believe it would help you with your movement and gestures. And if you take a look at a video, that's exactly Hello. what you did. I have grown and expanded. Let's kind of go, go back, like, you know, there's an example for me to go follow, so you can tell. And the next prompt, he tries that. I would say my biggest weakness is that I'm a bit of a perfectionist at times. I'm very passionate about my work. And when he goes to prompt four, by the end of eight days, you can see he's significantly better. So I was in a situation where I had to meet a challenge uh, with my leadership skills. Um, I was in my coding boot camp, and we were close to the end of it, um, towards the end. And then a different peer came in and acknowledged that progress and talked about you're doing it great with appropriate gestures, 
really does goes along with your speech and helps bring more enthusiasm and connectivity to the audience. Uh, so that's one example. Let me give you one other example. So let's zoom in somewhere else. Um, so here, ID7, the prompt was, tell me about your greatest achievement. And this is just a regular uh, online worker with high school education. As I have said previously, I'm a stay-at-home mom. So basically, anything I talk about involves my kids. I don't do a lot outside of being a stay-at-home mom. So from that, one of the peers talked about the sentence drops down in tone at the end of the sentence where you describe yourself as a stay-at-home mom, almost like you're not impressed with yourself. Uh, you have pride in what you do, and it comes through later on the video, but started off good too. Uh, this is what you do, you do it well. Project it in your tone to convince us. So you can tell on the next prompt. Uh, Conflict and leadership. Um, basically, what being a mom of four girls is all about. I don't know that there are many other houses that have as much conflict as ours. And then the person was able to come and acknowledge that you came out so confident in the beginning and felt that throughout the video, this is probably your strongest video yet from what I've seen. Um, so in the future, we'll see a lot of this AI-driven technology being deployed, uh, but I think it's really important to retain the core skills that makes us more human. Um, so on that note, I will pass the torch to John Kleinberg. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks very much. As you can see, we're running a randomized experiment, the speakers who came before the demo that Eshan showed versus mine, but I'm afraid the results might not be pretty. So um, one theme that's been, uh, that's been the case in, throughout the talks, I think, has been the issue of, in the workforce of, of the future, the, the issue of composition, right? The ways in which Skip, for example, talked about bringing new, 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 new kinds of people into the workforce, people facing mental health challenges, returning veterans, um, sus sustaining participation in the, in the workforce, right? The ch changing nature of one's experience in it over, over the life course as, uh, as, as what Phil was talking about. And of course, the changing nature of the work itself, right? Things like micro tasks, the importance of soft skills and computational interventions that might, might help with that. And if you think about it, one of the things that is latent in the background uh, when we think about composition is that there's a constant backdrop of screening decisions and evaluation that takes place, right? Things like hiring, right? Things like school admissions, for example. All of these which are acting as gating functions, right? Things like promotion, things like retention, right? All of these are cases where someone intervenes, makes an evaluation of a job applicant, a college applicant, a coworker up for, Promotion and a theme that we've been seeing increasingly in these domains is the following question if humans are making these decisions and humans are error-prone Humans are subject to biases um, Could we potentially improve things uh, if we find the right way to bring algorithms uh, and AI into the picture as part of these screening decisions because after all many of these follow a template that's recognizable from the standard pipeline of machine learning, right? We have an individual, someone very complex with complex life experiences that we can't possibly hope to fully represent. We create a set of features, we pass them to a decision maker who could be human or algorithmic, and we make some prediction about future performance that might uh, help guide a, an end-to-end -end decision. Now, the challenge, of course, is that the fact that we're trying to introduce something that may be algorithmic or computational this does not mean we'll necessarily make things better. We could equally well make things worse. And so the question is, how do we think about, in, in the case of what I'll focus on here, the, the risk of bias in particular, right? How does bias come into algorithmic decisions? But in fact, to understand that, we should ask, how does bias come into, into, into human decisions? Now, so with that in mind, uh, in, the, in the next few minutes, I want to talk about uh, three main points here. First, let's think about human bias and human decisions and how we can, un how we can un understand it. Um, secondly, if we bring algorithms into the picture, 
how can we regulate what's going on? How can we understand where bias might be creeping in there? And finally, to the extent that we can detect bias in an algorithmic decision, where is it coming from? What's contributing to it? Okay. So it helps to start with a few definitions, not mathematical ones, but actually legal definitions. If we look at the law on discrimination, right? So we're, in, you know, we're engaging in an employment decision, an admissions decision, and we'd like to ask, uh, is there bias taking place that's actually leading to outright discrimination uh, that might be legally challengeable? Then there are two broad categories that the body of law on discrimination in the US at least uh, recognizes. Um, the first is uh, what's called disparate treatment. And that's when there's actually an intent to deliberately favor certain applicants on protected categories such as race, gender, national origin, religion, or age. The second uh, is this broader class, more complex, called disparate impact, which says regardless of your intent, if the screening decision you're making has a disproportionate uh, adverse effect on some protected groups, such as the ones in the first bullet, then the burden of proof shifts to the decision maker to establish what's called business necessity. Right, so the canonical example would be there may be a profession in which you have to somehow do things that involve reaching up very high. And so requiring some sort of minimum height may simply be physically necessary. On the other hand, if I were hiring software developers and I put in a height requirement, it would be rather difficult to establish business necessity for that. Right? And so certain decisions that you're making which have an adverse impact, uh, it can matter whether you can justify them on the grounds of business necessity. Okay. Now, an important thing for understanding all of discrimination law is that it's predicated on something latent that's often not made explicit, but has been there from the beginning, which is essentially a, a principle from the behavioral sciences, that it's very hard to tell if a human decision maker has engaged in disparate treatment or disparate impact. Why is this? Well, when, when we think about difficulty in detecting discrimination, our thoughts immediately go to the problem of obfuscation or lying, right? You ask someone, are you discriminating? And they'll say no because, because they're lying. But there's a much more fundamental challenge, and really what, what makes it much harder, is that people may genuinely not know why they're making the decisions that they're making. Even if they are trying to help you as much as possible, to give their best effort at explaining why they did what they did, uh, they may simply not have the reasons correct. And in some sense, I think this, as we start thinking about the role of algorithms in computation, right, so far I've just been talking about human beings, Maybe the most useful thing to take away from this framing that I'm trying to put on the problem is that when we think about the question of interpretability, right? often when we think about the introduction of algorithms, we're concerned, but the algorithm will be this complex black box. It will be uninterpretable to us. We will not be able to understand its decisions. And what I'd like to argue is that both humans and algorithms are not interpretable. They both have profound challenges with interpretability, different ones, but profound ones, and that humans provide us with this illusion of an explanation, right? A human being is always happy to tell you why they think they did something. Uh, but that, again, that may not actually uh, correspond to interpretability. One place that we can actually look for some compelling examples of this is a long line of be behavioral science work. Uh, one of the seminal uh, pieces of research here is from the 1970s by Nis Nisbet and Wilson in a paper with the suggestive title, Telling More Than We Can Know. And what they did was they would create these conditions that were almost identical, where there'd be a, a single difference between them, right? Condition A and condition B. And people would do different things in condition A and condition B, one group in A, one group in B. And then you would ask people, why did you make the decision, which you know was different in the two situations. And they would give you reasons, but none of the reasons were the one thing that we know was different between them, right? So a simple example, I, I ask you, to uh, name a brand in some product category. I ask you to name a brand of laundry detergent, okay? But before that, I give you a word memorization task. I tell you, please memorize the following words. And in one group, they're just random. In the other group, I ask you to memorize words like beach, beach, ocean, moon. And then I ask you to name a brand of laundry detergent. And many more people say tide, right? That's a well-known effect, that's priming. I've primed you to think of the word tide. But now, they did something very clever. They asked people, why did you pick this one? 
And if you look at the reasons, it's because you know, my family uses Tide. When I was growing up, we used Tide. Uh, I remember it from an ad. Lots of things, but never because you primed me with these words, even though we know statistically that is the only thing that changed between these two conditions, right? So because someone's telling you why they did something, uh, may, that may not be the reason, right? And that's a big challenge, right? So that's what these experiments are. Many experiments in this category, right? I ask you to choose an article of clothing, but like a stage magician, I sort of force the right-hand one on you. But then you say the reason that you chose it was because of the color or the style or, or, or something like this, same kind of concept. Okay. So a key point that we'd uh, like to make, and this is in some joint work that I've been pursuing with uh, people from a range of different areas, with uh, Jens Ludwig, a public policy researcher, Sendel Malinathan, a behavioral economist, and Cass Sunstein, uh, a legal scholar. The four of us have been thinking about this question of algorithmic discrimination. And rather than try to get to the bottom of the question, will algorithms create more or less bias, something else that we're, that we're thinking about, we want to pick a sort of orthogonal issue, which is that in any event, there are ways in which well-regulated algorithms may make discrimination easier to detect, right? If we think about the black box of human decision-making, there are certain things we can do with algorithms that we simply can't do with human uh, decisions. Now, when I, when I say algorithms making screen decisions, there's a sort of important definitional point to make here, which is there are always two algorithms that we're talking about, right? The whole point of machine learning is it is an algorithm that produces an algorithm to classify, right? So there's the training algorithm, but the output of the training algorithm is an algorithm. It is a classifier which takes inputs and produces classifications. Um, and the, the classifier and the trainer are both in, 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 interesting objects to think about. But our point is, if these things are constructed using the standard pipeline of machine learning, the one I showed at the beginning, right? We have a way of producing features. We have a way of producing target labels. Uh, we have a training procedure that evaluates on some uh, out of sample basis, then we can do certain things, right? We can't read the code and expect to understand the algorithm, right? That's both cognitively difficult for human beings, mathematical facts like undecidability tell us we can't ever expect to do that. But we can do certain things. We can, for example, examine the objective function that you put into the training procedure, right? What is it that you were trying to optimize? And part of the point is that designing an algorithm for doing screening decisions requires that you have a discussion and a specification of what your objective function is, something that you do not need to do if you're a human making a decision in an in, in ad hoc way. Right? If you think about the human hiring committees that you have sat on, there's not generally a discussion of the objective function except in, extreme, except in qualitative terms. We can also, for example, reproduce what people did. We can say, okay, give us your data. We're going to, in the style of, say, you know, a Netflix prize competition type of scenario, we're going to build our own screening rule and see, can we achieve similar performance with less, less bias? We can, for example, provide counterfactuals to the classifier. We can say, I'm going to take this input, but now I'm going to flip the value of this feature. I'm going to flip the gender on this input. What would the answer be? Right? Something that, again, is essentially impossible. Right? We can ask that question to humans. It's very hard to get a real answer about that, even if they're trying their best. Now, all of this says we can perform these kinds of inspections. Um, but there's a key adjective at the, on the very first line of the slide, well-regulated al algorithms. Clearly, if the algorithms in the background were not able to see the features or the objective function, we're not able to see the classifier, then we simply have a situation where an actor with bad intent now has a powerful tool, an algorithm hidden in the background. There's nothing about that scenario that should give us cause for hope. But if there's some kind of a record keeping requirement, right, that you need to actually disclose the training data, the features, the objective function that you used, uh, then we, we can imagine doing these, these sorts of things. And a key point here is this may sound like an onerous record keeping burden, but in many industries, when there's will to engage in, these, in this kind of regulation, it often comes with comparably substantial record keeping requirements. Think of the financial services in the industry where the record keeping requirements on markets that sometimes total trillions of dollars in exchanges can be quite substantial. And with this, the final point is that we could hope to actually then decompose sources of bias in ways that we really can't hope to in the case of human decision making. This is again not to say whether the bias will be greater or less, only that certain aspects of detectability become much clearer. Right? We can now look at the choice of 
the label or the outcome people were using. We can look at how people chose to create features from the individuals. And finally, we can look at the training procedure that was used, including the possibility that train data may have been non-representative, or for example, that the future activity that they're predicting may not resemble the past in which it was trained. And so for all these reasons, I think there are these interesting contrasts between human decision-making and alg algorithmic decision-making that I, I think should inform how we think about the issues of bias and discrimination in these two modes, human and, and algorithmic. And I think all of these are going to be an important part of the backdrop for how we think about the composition of the workforce, both at the level of entry, at the level of continuity and sustainability and promotion as we go forward. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jared. So we have time for questions. Moshevadi from Bayes University. This is a question to John. So I hear this argument, judges or, or this is human decision makers are biased too. But there are many of them. And they are biased in, 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 in numerous, many different ways. And one aspect that we need to worry about algorithms is that the, there will be a, a very, very small number of algorithms making important decisions. Yeah. And that means that we are now codifying a bias. Instead of having, yes, there's a bias, but it's randomized. But now we, we might have a kind of a dominant bias in, in some system. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think actually in a number of domains, uh, when we introduce algorithms, we see this danger of monoculture. Uh, we see this, for example, to take a very different analogy in computer security. There's, there's this, this concern that if we're all running you know, the same system, then it becomes susceptible to the same ex exploits. And, the, and there's an analog of that going on here. And I think we could actually look to some of those analogies, right? The introduction of deliberate artificial heterocultural, for example, right? That we may actually want m multiple different modalities. We may want explicit randomization, um, I think is one, is, is one point. I, I think also it's, it's useful to think about, you know, when we think about ad hoc human decision making and then we move to algorithms, there's an interesting, interpolation point in between, which is the growth of bureaucracy over the course of the 20th mm -hmm. century. Because bureaucracy was in its own non-electronic way an attempt at systematizing certain processes so that mm -hmm. everyone would do things the same way. And so I think we, we, we can also look to some of the thinking and organizational behavior around how do we keep bureaucracy from becoming monolithic to the extent that that has mm -hmm. been successful um, as a partial answer as well. Sydney. Uh, thanks, everybody, for a really uh, insightful panel. Um, I had a question on the um, I call it micro tasking. Tasking is that correct? Um, you know, I think I, I think it's a really neat idea, and the way you, you guys have done it. Um, I guess I was just thinking a little bit. Um, I've, I've done some work a few years ago in multitasking, and there's a there's a huge switch cost uh, when you're switching tasks. It's also just uh, to put it bluntly, exhausting. Um, and I wonder if you've collected those data uh, in addition to uh, efficiency. Um, so that's that's one part. Um, and second, um, you know, I'm thinking there is an advantage. Uh, we study daydreaming and mind wandering. There's an advantage to just having those moments in the car where you let yourself just just drift away. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, it, it correlates with trade creativity and, and such. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of the trade-off? Um, thank you. So I'll tackle the mind-wandering question first. So there is actually evidence that mind-wandering in the car can have negative impact because yeah. it causes people to lose control over their conscious thoughts. And so there is some effort in kind of like trying to uh, rein in those thoughts so that you don't totally lose your focus on the road. Uh, coming back to microtasking and multitasking, we, we have done some studies around what are some of the benefits of microtasking uh, versus multitasking. And the way that I differentiate this is that multitasking is where you are switching, and switching could happen at different levels. So it could be within a task. I'm switching from uh, maybe writing a document to saving it. That's a very, very low level task. And then it could be at a high level that I'm switching from programming to checking my email. The reason why, and we have found that in studies where we look at microtask uh, performance versus just like having a 
larger macro tasks. The reason why micro tasks often perform better in certain settings is because these are self-contained uh, little units of things. Mm. And so you once you complete one, you move on to something else. And because the context is typically contained within that task, that means that you are able to quickly uh, ramp up to that. Now, we have used micro tasks in different ways. So we have used to actually start or use a bunch of micro tasks that are all on a related content to start building up some of the context so that it helps you launch into something bigger. But uh, yeah, there are different ways that you can think about multitasks. We have also thought of multi, sorry, micro tasks as a way of breaking context. And so if you totally randomize that, okay, you're going to do this type of micro task and the next one is on a completely different topic, it works in certain situations. It was awful in the car study that I had mm. described. That was the pilot part and we totally abandoned that, okay, we have to have some kind of rhyme or reason to why the system is asking certain questions. It can be totally out of the blue. Um, I have a question for Phil. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the senior people, and you recruit senior people. You try to give them the college education so that they can have second another career. But I'm thinking, like, uh, is this reasonable? Because, uh, like, uh, for senior people, mm -hmm. their cognitive capacity and and also other skills, right. they are different, different. and. Um, so, well, that, of course, second career is good, but uh, mm -hmm. would that add yeah. stress yeah. to them? Yeah. That's number one. Number two is, the, like, a, it's a culture also different. Like in China, for example, mm -hmm. s people retire, then they help to raise their grandkids. Right. Then this is also some kind of, like, sure. activities and keep them busy. Yeah, yeah. So yep. what do you think, like yep. these choices? Let me take your, let me take your second um, question first, because I think it's an important uh, issue in its own right. First of all, in China, as you know, retirement is very young. Uh, it's currently 55 for women and 60 for men. So this is a big issue when you think about lifespans that are going to go on for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, it is absolutely true that if you look at the data in terms of Outcome. There are a number of studies that have shown that grandparenting, because it is a sense of purpose, has a positive correlation with outcome in its own right. What it doesn't do necessarily is create community, so it may not prolong the well-being of the individual in the same manner. So this is a you know, second issue. But there are diff very different social structures in different parts of the world, you know, as, as you um, certainly know. To the point you began with, here's what we do know. We do know that, uh, and this speaks to the session that you ran this morning, um, processing speed changes dramatically over time. So my processing speed is significantly different than it was when I was in my 20s or 30s. But at the same time, um, over time, one gains a combination of knowledge and wisdom. Um, so these are huge correlates. And I think that's one of the reasons why these intergenerational relationships that I described to you are so profound um, and so meaningful. I I'll finally say that our students, uh, our fellows, when they are in classes where the demands are high, do have a lot of anxiety, but they have found ways of overcoming them and feeling very proud at the end of that, so. My question is for Phil as well, just building upon that a little bit. Um, so it, it was really fascinating to hear about, you know, the sense of purpose and connectedness that you talked about. Uh, in addition to talking about second careers for people who have already accomplished something in their first careers. Has there been any work in revamping higher education or even K-12 education to help younger people identify a sense of purpose or that connectedness? Because there is a crisis among younger people when it comes to mental health yeah. and you know suicides and so on. Yeah. So has there been any work in yeah. that? So a um, couple of things. First of all, um, some of the initial work on purpose was done by Bill Damon, um, and he studied adolescents from the ages of 13 to 21. 
uh, and broke them down. He followed a 1,200 young people and broke them down into four categories. Uh, about 25% have no sense of purpose. About 25% have a significant sense of purpose. Um, and then the others are kind of in the middle, you know, sort of dabblers and venturers. Obviously, that has an impact on how people do in life. And then they've repeated that study, actually, uh, in individuals over 50, um, and same number, and about a third of individuals over 50 um, fall into this category of purpose with this caveat. It's purpose beyond the self. So purpose beyond the self means that I'm not just interested in my financial security or in my job. I'm interested in, can I change my community? Can I change the world? Can I do something that's going to have a larger impact? And that's one of the things that correlates with this positive outcome that I addressed. Before I take the next question, let me stir up a bit of controversy. Um, how many of you heard, attended the morning session on microproductivity? Some of you, okay, a lot of you. So you may remember uh, the dark question the session ended with. Uh, Moshe Verdi talked about uh, Taylorism. Like in the 19th century, industries will use Taylorism where they would take a large task and break it into smaller chunks. And some of the downside could be you can take an unpleasant or unethical task and break into smaller chunks and have people do them without their consent. Uh, or maybe there is only one way to do the best result. You never try the other ways to get to the optimal result. So my question to Shamsi is, as you try <laughs> macroproductivity, what are the negative implications and how do you really mitigate those? Yeah, I, I thought that I had dodged that question and passed it on to my panelists during that session. So yeah, it, of course you had to bring it back. back. <laughs> I know. I, I knew that it, this was going to come back to me at some point. I, I, I think it, it's a valid question. As I said in, in, in that session, is that we are now right now looking at the positives, but there's of course there's going to, be, going to be negative. People are going to exploit this. People are going to use this in different ways to kind of like get their, uh, I mean, underlying uh, things done. But I think that it also maybe boils down to letting people know about what is the bigger picture here. And so if you do a task, what are you actually contributing towards? Um, I think that's one. The other one is that let people explore their own ways of doing things. So it's not that everything needs to be scripted in a particular way, that you need to do a certain thing in this particular workflow. It could be in different ways. And what we are looking at is that let people come up with their own breakdowns of things. We already do that in some sense. Hmm. Different people break down the same task in different ways, and they would do it in different ways. So we're not necessarily saying that it needs to be totally scripted. But yes, I, I think that there's dark sides, and especially mm -hmm. about how you, uh, what do you do with this kind of like encroaching practice of wanting to do work all the time. Because if you give people tools to do work, they will continue to do work. And so how do you create those boundaries and make sure uh, that people are able to disengage and relax and the importance mm. of breaks and taking walks? How do you, and if you look at the current research about multitasking, these things are becoming more and more in the forefront. A few years ago, it was all about being productive. How can you make people get more done, be more efficient? But now the conversations around well-being and mm -hmm. mental Great. health, all of these things are coming through. So we're not thinking in just one dimension. We have to be kind of like much more broader. Good for you. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I really uh, love the, well, all of the talks, but I love the discussion around the Distinguished Careers Institute. Um, I'm at that age. I'm not going to apply, but I'm at that age. I just <laughs> recently retired. But I'm also wondering, um, uh, I love the intergenerational uh, aspect of it that you alluded to, and didn't, I'd love more detail on that so maybe later. But. Um, um, I was thinking that in the context of, is, are there thoughts of broadening what you're doing, broadening yeah. the mission? And uh, I'm, I'm thinking in general, there are a whole lot of college campuses um, where the dormitories are mostly empty during the summertime. And there are a lot of teens at risk out there without any sense of purpose and may, may, or, or without a sufficient sense of purpose to stay away from some of the temptations that might lead them astray. So uh, is there any thought to, um, and then the intergenerational part of that is, I, I don't know how you would bring that together, but I would, you know, is there any thought to extending what you're doing uh, to, the, to the benefit both of, of people in my age and people maybe younger than college students? I mean, let's, let's face yeah. it, Stanford college students are probably likely already on a successful path, but what about all the teens that maybe 
could benefit from a, no. a summer on a college campus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think this whole, I'll be brief about this, because I think the whole concept of intergenerational interaction is really important for all of our futures. And there are many different formulations that that can take place. And so I'll give you one uh, example that's not related to what we're doing, but you know many young people when they leave college like to go to do Teach for America or something like that. It turns out that that tends to be a very highly stressful job throwing a young person in a classroom in a very challenged environment. If you pair that person with someone in middle age or above, the outcome is significantly better for all parties. Mm. So I think there are lots of examples that we can, can look at. Our, our college uh, campus at Stanford uh, literally becomes a high school during the summer. Um, and I think you're right. There's lots of ways of you know, bringing these communities together. I'm actually looking at not just um, uh, faculty per se, but you know, we wind up having tons of emeritus faculty who become without an anchor, and yet they can also participate very actively in some of these um, settings. So the point is well taken. Okay, uh, thank you for all these presentations. They're really uh, thought-provoking. And I apologize, I have very layperson questions for you. Uh, one of them, I guess, is related to the micro-tasking as well as to the uh, Distinguished Careers Program. It seems like there is this cliff in the number of working hours uh, pre- and post-retirement. And I wonder if there's any research, probably from the data that Chumsey has, about how many hours should people be working uh, on an age-adjusted basis? Uh, Mine hasn't and, changed yet. <laughs> and I guess the other question, which is more to uh, the uh, Distinguished Careers Program, it seems like the goals of this program are a lot similar to the goals of urban design, where you're trying to create com connected communities, you're trying to create a sense of purpose. And I wonder, you know, why should we, as academics, be solving a problem which has some pretty good solutions in urban design? Or alternatively, what can we learn from that? Should I go first? Well, thank you for the idea of a new research project. And so maybe <laughs> Phil and I can yeah. start collaborating. But yeah, uh, I, I think that that's a great question. I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the session this morning, so Jamie and I had this idea that, well, we want to reduce the work week from 40 hours to 30 hours without actually reducing the work. It's just that we want to make work, work so efficient that you can actually end up saving time. That is a concept. We don't have any metrics about that yet. Uh, we are hoping that being just by enabling people to move away from the desktop, maybe we can actually make use of these unusable moments. So if you kind of like defrag them together, you get something that's useful. It would be really fun to look at how it helps as people kind of like progress through their career and re reach at a point of retirement. My, my, my dad is a medical doctor. He retired a few years ago, and he was fine just painting and kind of like watching movies. And then suddenly last year, he decided that he wanted to go back and teach. So I mean, he wanted to have some kind of purpose. Uh, but I mean, maybe you, how do you ease people into that and ease them out? Because now he's also again saying that I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I digress a little bit. But I think that there's also some opportunity of thinking about, OK, so are there ways that we could leverage the knowledge, the skills, the expertise that this group of people have? and then make them feel that they are contributing, they are participating in stuff, they're making progress without having them to feel that they're overwhelmed. Last question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for John about bias. <clears throat> so you talk about uh, counterfactual analysis by flipping feature values. So you assume that the data set you have, it has all the features or all the feature values. So what if you had missing values and missing features? How would you attack the bias problem? Thank you. Right. Yeah, so those are, those are very good questions. The, the counterfactual point there was relatively narrowly scoped, which is simply that if I have an algorithm, it's capable of, of answering questions about synthetic data in a way that people are not, not necessarily as equipped to do. But 
the broader question of missing values or even worse, missing features is, is extremely important. It, it comes up in a, a number of ways. One is um, often features are missing for reasons of the upstream process that produced the data. So for example, I am trying to train something to evaluate job applicants. If I attempt, for example, to train it on the people I've, I've already hired, then I'm training it on people who were actually subject to the selection process that as humans we had all, all, all already applied. So we have a, a selective labels problem in, in, in which there may be bias that even affects which people have labels and which people don't in the, in the training data. There's also the issue of features that we simply didn't think to measure, for example. Right? So there, there could be attributes of people that are significant for the decision task. Uh, they weren't recorded. And I, I think this is actually a sort of one technical interpretation of the more qualitative or subjective concern that people have when they say algorithms can't provide individualized evaluation of people. Right? So one often hears this fear that the problem if we deploy an algorithm is it won't be able to you know, give you an individualized assessment in the same way a human could. Initially, that's puzzling because after all, isn't the algorithm taking you as input and running? Mm. But I think if you sort of dig into you know, how might we formalize what's, what's going on there, it says that you know, we collect some features about someone. It could be 100, it could be 1,000, it could be a very wide feature set. Despite that, in your particular case, there will probably be a thousand and first feature or mm -hmm. a three thousandth feature that has very low recall, right? It's relevant to you, but to very few other people. That to a human with their domain knowledge, they would be able to link that with other things that they know and have that affect their decision. The algorithm is not equipped to do that. And I think that's, a, that's quite a broad mm -hmm. uh, open problem where the standard vocabulary of algorithms and machine learning is not directly equipped to handle that, right? How do we talk about features that we did not think to collect, right? This is not a feature selection problem where we say I have a thousand features, which 10 are the most informative. This thing, I have a thousand features, what did I not even measure that a, someone with more domain knowledge would have thought to measure? And, and that, again, it's a very wide open question. That is the end of the panel. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.